This is Basement Chronicles with Lisa Dublin, episode number 25. Hey, you made it! Welcome to my basement! I'm Lisa Dublin, a health and life coach, and I help professional and executive women to live, lead, and speak with confidence. Because you know what? Developing your confidence and deepening your faith in God is the best formula for an amazing life. So, are you ready? Let's go. Hey, everybody. Episode number 25, and guess what? We are at 2,500 downloads, okay? I am so grateful for everyone who has tuned in, who has downloaded this podcast, who has shared it in a WhatsApp group or on their page or in their stories. Can I ask you to do that right now? Like, send this podcast to 10 of your friends and say, hey, this is worth the listen. Please tell me what you think. So shout out to my client who listened to the last episode and just simply surprised me this week, came on the call and she's like, I started working out. I heard the podcast and I just stopped giving myself excuses. How she said it was that I said to myself, shut up and do it. (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) That was a moment. She just simply said to herself, shut up and get it done. So in the last podcast, I was talking about how faith and fitness are, you know, together, these two are a habit that I've formed that really helps me to continue to be productive, to continue to show up and not to be weary of spirit or of body. So go take a listen to episode number 24. Listen again and again, and I hope you find your groove and you get unstuck. Today, I'm going to talk about a very sensitive topic. So I want to warn all the parents beforehand that this one, this episode is not necessarily for the younger children. I don't usually use language that's salty, but this one might get just a tad strong because I will be relaying certain incidents. So please, please put on your AirPods or listen when the kids are not around this episode is not for the kids. Okay, let's start. Did you guys see the video where Diddy was really beating on his girlfriend at the time, Cassie Ventura? This was a video from 2016 that recently surfaced. And there are so many questions about like who had it? Why did people hold on to it even when Cassie had brought her lawsuit? Where was it? All of that. Anywho, that's not our concern today. We want to look at the impact of such a video. I don't know about you, but I'm not usually around domestic violence incidents. You know, it's not part of what I grew up with or saw. I'm not even in my community or anything of the sort. Although I myself have had such an incident, and I'm going to talk about that today. But I saw it, and, you know, it really triggered me. It made me very angry. When I see stuff like that, perhaps on television or hear about it, I usually get very angry that a man thinks that he has the right to treat a woman like that. Sometimes men even take out belts (laughs) to beat a woman. Can you imagine? You probably can. You probably have seen it and hopefully you have not experienced it. But, you know, that is the world in which we live. So that incident, when I saw it, and if you haven't seen it, go check it out on the internet because I think it's worth looking at to see the kind of monster that this man really is. Like this woman is running away from him barefoot in the hallway of the hotel lobby and he runs after her in a towel. He hits her in the face. He throws her down. He stomps on her. Then he does it again. He picks up her bag and her belongings, drags her like a piece of meat, okay? Like a piece of luggage, drags her into the room and the video continues you see him striking her down again in another flash you see him like he's sitting and he literally throws a vase at her it is infuriating to say the least and I saw it and I felt all the negative emotions of who is this person to think that he can do it to a woman but here's what happened the very next day I experienced another power imbalance play out right before my eyes. We went out of town for the May long weekend. 
And I stopped to get coffee. I stopped to get my Americano at a very popular Canadian coffee chain here. And when I did, the attendant was very angry, apparently. Didn't think that he had to be there because he literally said it under his breath and I heard. And then he proceeded to berate his colleague. That colleague happened to be an elderly Filipino woman who could easily be his grandmother. This guy was white male, early 20s, and he's shouting and cussing out this middle-aged elderly Filipino woman who's just trying to do her job. That's what it seemed. And he goes like, and this is where it gets a bit salty, okay? He's like, I have asked you four times for the effing caddy. Where is it? And she's like, what? He says it again and again, at least four or five times, berating this woman, embarrassing and humiliating her before the clients who were there. You know how when you're on a line and you're just minding your business in your thoughts, as we want to do, and then it takes you a minute or two to get out and to climb out of your thoughts and look around and see what's happening? That's what happened to me. Like, while it was going on, I was a bit hazy because I was thinking of whatever I don't even know. But when I realized that, hey, I am literally seeing one person abusing another before me, I literally out loud said, oh, hell no. And I took out my phone and I began recording him. At that time, the gentleman had stopped shouting after the woman, but you could see the anger still because he was moving from one side of the counter to the next, slamming dishes and plates and all of the things, okay? I got that on camera. He saw that I was recording because I was not shy about it. And of course, though I was next on the line, he refused to come take my order. So I stood there watching him doing something else in the background instead of coming to the front as, you know, the attendants are wont to do and to deal with my order. So someone else came to deal with my order. I, I proceeded to say to her what happened in a very loud voice. You guys, I was literally trembling. Just to see it play out and to see this woman take this, to see, you know, just her feeling so small before him. And this man going on and on, tearing into this woman. I was literally shaking by the time I got to the cash register to pay for my coffee. And I let it be known that this was not okay. I let it be known that this young guy was disrespecting and abusing somebody who was older than him, who was a woman, who could easily be his grandmother, and there was no need for that. So what happened is they took my number and my name, and later in the day, the manager called and asked me what happened. I used my voice. I spoke up, and I told her what I saw, and I also sent her the video. But both of those incidents, and I believe that the second incident really impacted me because I had seen the video from before. And when I think of the two incidents together, what really stands out for me is the need for us to know who we are. And this is not in any way blaming any of the women, but I was just reflecting on my own experience and how I too experienced some form of domestic violence once in my life and how I got out of it to the point where it's going to be very difficult for me to accept it again just because I think I see a process of how to stay out of that kind of situation. Again, there's no blame whatsoever. I turned the situation in on my own self, and that is what I want to offer to you today. So here's my story, okay? A very long time ago, <laughs> when I was in my 20s. My God, have you realized how many things happened in my 20s, you guys? Oh my goodness. Like, that was my Waterloo. I think those very formative years were so turbulent because God was really preparing me for such a time as this where, you know, I'd be wise and I'd have something to say to offer to people younger than I and even my age who are going through right now. So a long time ago, I was in my early 20s. I was living away from home in Trinidad, studying, doing my master's. And also working, I think I was either at The Guardian or somewhere, The Guardian or The Express at the time. And I met this guy. He happened to be Trinidadian, Nigerian. 
And, you know, we got together and I thought I was in love, except that I was just simply tired. Except that I don't even know what it was, but it definitely was not love. This guy made me feel like I should have been grateful that he even looked at me. So he would say things like, you know, I mean, you're not everybody's cup of tea, but you're mine. You know, making me feel like, oh my goodness, something's wrong with me and I should be happy and grateful me that at least he took me on. On top of that, there was always that sense of I was not enough, that something was wrong with me. So he was constantly trying to change me, constantly pointing out things that I did that were wrong, that were affecting him and how he was trying with me. Has that ever happened to you? Listen, like this podcast is not going to be all over the place. But I am going to interject at certain points to say, if you recognize that kind of abuse in what I'm saying, if you are experiencing it, please start to see yourself getting out and walking out of that situation because it is not ideal. Now, I should have seen the signs. Let me tell you one of the worst things that this guy did before the incident of domestic violence when he hit me. When I graduated, so I had just finished, I think, the undergraduate degree. So we were together at that time before I started the master's. And I happened to be the valedictorian for my graduating class. And it had been a very tough time for me. If you've listened to my story, it's also on YouTube on Basement Chronicles. You can go see, like, my signature story there. And I laid all out how I suffered from depression and bulimia and got out of that, etc. So when I graduated top of my class or one of the top of my class and I was also chosen as valedictorian, it was a big thing. Who, who loves somebody would not be happy for that person and want to bear witness when you stand up to speak before thousands of people in the graduation ceremony and you're about to give your valedictory address. Which lover would not want to be present. Just somebody who didn't love you, perhaps. And that's what happened to me. Because at the time when I was announced and I got up to speak to these thousands of people to give the valedictory address, he got up and he left the ceremony. It was in the open air in the auditorium at the St. Augustine campus. But I had eyes for only him, so I saw when he left. Okay, I knew where he was sitting and expecting to, you know, almost in a sense, be speaking to him with him in the back of my mind. But my man, my soon-to-be husband, he got up and he left the ceremony. Later, he said that his back was hurting him and had been a long time sitting. Man, please, if your guy is doing that, he's jealous. Get out because you will end up having to fold yourself into corners and boxes to satisfy him. And you know, when you do that, he will still not be satisfied because he will understand that almost you're trying to please him, that you're more than he is, and he is going to despise you for not recognizing your worth and getting the hell out. So please do yourself a favor. If that is your guy who wants you to be smaller than you really are, please get out so that you can be your full self. Anyway, we continued our relationship and we happened to go to... And that incident happened. By the time he hit me for some inane reason in his parents' house, he had broken down my self-worth to the point where I almost thought that I deserved it. Why do I say that I thought that I deserved it? Because after it happened, I left the house for a season. But he came back with tears in his eyes, apologizing. Oh, it was not my fault. You made me do it. I'm so sorry. I won't do it again. Then his mother jumped in with her own entreaties and promises to keep him in check and all of that. Lisa walked back into the relationship. My parents were not pleased at all and were very wary of him. However, I decided to take the next step and bring him to St. Lucia to meet the parents and to kind of meet the family because we were really planning to get married. Do you know, the night after we got to St. Lucia, in my parents' house, this guy tried to hit me again. We were alone. I just know that if we were anywhere but in my parents' house, he would have hit me, because like he was literally controlling his fists at that point. I think everybody has a breaking point, and that was it for me. The next morning, I told my mom what happened. Then she told my father, and they decided that the best thing to do in light of a man who cannot keep his hands off me, 
physically was to put him on the next flight back to Trinidad. And that's what they did. They paid for his flight and said, I'm so sorry, treated him with dignity and respect, but with a very firm surgical, you are getting out. I won't ever forget that. It was almost cementing for me that actions have consequences. And although you can say sorry, you do have to do what's best for you. The other thing that cemented it for me and made sure that I did not go back into that situation, and we are talking about identity, and I hope you will see it when I tell you this next piece of the story, was this. That morning, after we had let him go, put him on that flight back to Trinidad, that morning I met my aunt and her husband, my uncle, in town, in Castries, walking the streets, you know, My aunt, you know, she was so excited. Where is he? Because everybody knew that I was coming down with my fiancé, with the person I was going to marry. So the entire family wanted to meet him. But he wasn't there. And I didn't lie. I told my auntie what happened. And here is the image that has stuck in my mind as a conviction that when you know yourself and when you believe a certain thing about you, it prevents you from doing certain things or from accepting other things from people that have nothing to do with your chosen identity. My aunt, who looks like me incidentally, she adjusted, when she heard the story, she adjusted her handbag on her shoulder. Just imagine it, you guys, a Caribbean woman, kind of buxomed, okay? She looks like me. And she's very angry at this point. And her husband, who is very supportive, they have a good marriage. He, too, is shaking his head, standing next to her. And they're talking to me, the niece. My aunt says to me, and they call me Ishmoy. If you are St. Lucia and you know what that means, it means my child. It is a term of endearment. My family uses it regularly for all of us. So she's like, let me tell you something, Ishmoy. We did not bring you up for you to take this from anybody. We sent you to school. You got your qualifications, your education. You have all of these things going for you. You are not going to take that from any man. The conviction with which my auntie said it, it did it for me. It was no longer a matter of whether I loved him or not. It was no longer a matter of, you know, maybe we could work it out. The thing was the identity that she had defined for me And that even my mom and dad had started that morning to say that if you are this person, you cannot accept that. We will take the action to make sure that this is not your reality. That cemented it for me. I understood I was not the kind of person who took a lash from a man. It was not me. And I believe it was from that time I began that process of reading books on self-esteem of also getting deeper into my faith and understanding that what God said about me was that I was precious and valuable. And what that meant was that I expected people to behave a certain way towards me and that I had a responsibility if they didn't to get out of the situation. Also coming out of that entire long process is something that I say very often, something that I mean with every fiber of my being. So please, if there are kids, we don't want them to hear this. This is my overriding kind of thought. I am not a toilet bowl and I don't take shit. The only place I know that takes waste, garbage, crap is the toilet bowl. I'm not a toilet bowl. No part of me is. God does not make human beings to be that way, to take that kind of behavior from other people. And so what I want to start off by saying, it's not even a matter of what other people do or try to do or try to give you. It's a matter of what you see yourself being able to accept. No one can tell me that I'm not a woman. I hope you too are very firm in your identity, whatever it is. No one can tell me. You can say all sorts of things. You can perhaps bring like male clothes for me, male perfume. I'd be like, no, I can't accept it because this is not me. It does not fit who I am. Please take it back because I am so sure in who I am. I hope that 
example works in this day and age? I hope like maybe a couple years now, I know we live in a society that thinks that gender is so fluid. So I hope this example works for my audience. I think it does because, you know, we follow biblical principles. God made me a woman, no matter what anybody does to try to say otherwise. And it's not like I've got that at all. I'm just using it as an example. I just want it to be that stock that, you know, you're this. I'm trying to give you something different to make you believe that you're something else. And I'll be like, no, I'm sorry. Like hold the aftershave and perhaps hold maybe what male underwear, whatever, because this is not me. I'm female. So give me female things in the same way. I'm a diamond. Give me things that you give to a diamond. I am not a garbage bin. I am not a toilet bowl. So I cannot take garbage. I cannot take any of the crap that you want to give, please hold it because it cannot be for me. I am not built to take it. But the question remains, how do we end up accepting less than we are worth? What is that process that means that we believe certain people over others about who we are? I think it first starts with whether or not we have a God concept of who we are. I didn't see a self-concept because sometimes that too is flawed, that we don't see ourselves the way God sees us and that can create problems. I know not everyone would have had a family behind them to remind them of who they are like I did, but we all have access to who the creator says we are and those definitions are the most true about us. Before a man hits a woman, There is a lot of denigrating that takes place. There is a lot of him making you feel like you are nothing, like something is wrong with you, like you should be grateful that someone even paid you attention, like he was doing you a favor. Man, please. That's what happened to me, so that's why I'm talking about it in that way. And you will accept those things that he says about you if you make that man your God. Think about it. If you believe what a man says about you over what your creator said about you, you are making the man your God. When you get him off the pedestal, you will see yourself more clearly. If you don't put God first before that guy, you will believe the guy over God. And here's what's going to happen. Because you believe him, it's going to be easier for him to physically abuse you or sexually abuse you because your image of yourself has been lowered to fit what he has said. So you finally believe that you are the person who deserves the kind of treatment that he is meeting out and you think because something's wrong with you, that's what you deserve. It's all a lie. Now, if you are in that situation today, maybe a situation where there's physical abuse or sexual abuse, maybe you feel helpless by this talk. You do not feel enabled. You do not feel empowered. If that is you, I want you to first of all know that there's hope that people get out of those situations, that your situation is not the worst and you can get out by seeing yourself differently. I believe faith and obedience to God are two ways for us to start to pick up the pieces and put our lives back together. If you have a right understanding of who God says you are, not only will your identity be changed, but your behavior is also going to change. Many times in such situations, people, yes, they want to believe what God says about them, but they don't want to do the obedience bit. They don't want to, you know, get away from a relationship where they're not married and having sex, for example. They don't want to stop living with somebody. They don't want to turn to God in a way that shows you want to put him first. But you can't separate coming out of a dire situation and not really taking to the person who can help you. You have to go all the way for it to actually work. I believe stuff like taking the verses of scripture and beginning to meditate on them, beginning to ask God to reveal the truth of those scriptures. Lord, what did you say that I am? How am I blessed and highly favored when I am in this situation? How am I above only and not beneath? Show me how I am the head and not the tail. Lord, especially this one, can you show me how I have nothing missing and nothing broken? Because all day, whole day, all I hear in my head is that I am this and I am that. I am not enough that I should be grateful somebody even took me on. Lord, how is it true that I 
have nothing missing and nothing broken. Because the minute you begin to see your sufficiency in God, you will no longer need what a man who is abusive is offering. Also, I think on another level in your quiet time, there is a question that we can all ask ourselves. I still ask myself this question because there are areas in my life where I still need to come up. I still need to grow into the image of who God says I am. It's not just about relationships in every area of your life. You have to see yourself as God sees you. And this question is as follows. If I am a high value person, a person who's precious, a person who's whole, what do I give? What do I accept? How should I be? How should I move in this world as a person who is complete? What can I really accept from somebody else if I am that person who is whole? When you begin to answer these dangerous questions, the answers are going to lead you to make certain decisions about who you're going to be with, what you accept, what is no longer okay. So I don't want you to be discouraged because all of us are on a journey. Get help if you need to. Some situations are more difficult than others. I think the key is not to stay in the dark. Tell a trusted friend. Find a counselor. Go get help. Because if you don't disclose to people who can help you, then the abuse is going to continue. But don't stay in the dark. Get help and get out of an abusive situation. So I hope this podcast episode is valuable to you. Please rate it on Apple Podcasts. Like it on YouTube. In fact, subscribe to Basement Chronicles on YouTube. The link is in the show notes to this episode. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Thank you so much for listening today. Now, I know that you prioritize your growth and success. So if you feel stuck in any area of your life, why don't you consider life coaching? My signature program, How to Get Unstuck Total Transformation, has helped so many professional and executive women to free themselves of limiting beliefs and habits, learn to love and prioritize themselves, set firm boundaries and stick to them, be more confident, move up exponentially in their careers, and become the best versions of themselves. How badly do you want to get unstuck? How badly do you want to be the best version of you? If you desire more, take the first step right now. Go to my website, lisamdublin.com slash coaching and book a consultation with me. Let's talk about your coaching needs because the life you want is totally possible.